Thank you, Charles. It's nice to be with you all at the Metropolitan Tabernacle in Belfast this evening. At least that's where the videos are from. I might even be in those videos, a little boy going with uh, my mum and my aunt there on a Sunday night. I remember that the main attraction of the tabernacle was upstairs afterwards where they had all the cakes. That was the place to be. But anyway, that's not, wh that's not where we are. It's good to be with you folks out in Kelty and around the UK this evening. If you have a Bible, we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 17 this evening. 1 Samuel chapter 17. Now, recently, the BBC screened a documentary on this chap on the screen. Some of you might recognise him from lockdown. His name is Joe Wicks. He's the UK's favourite PE teacher. And throughout lockdown, he was doing family-friendly, um, all-age-friendly um, PE sessions on YouTube. The story, the program explores his story, his rags to riches story. Joe um, grew up in a family that was in great turmoil. His dad was a drug addict. His mom suffered from severe OCD. And to cope with the stress and strain of life at home, Joe turned to exercise as a way of coping. And now he spends a lot of his time seeking to help other people discover how exercise can help them cope with the stresses and struggles of modern day life. But what I find most interesting about the documentary was how they showed how his new public profile over these last two years has led just to this massive influx of people, hundreds of people every single day, reaching out to Joe, asking him to help them, to, to comfort them, to encourage them, to give them advice and wisdom. He talks about how he spends hours every single day trying to reply personally to all the messages he receives. The problem is that he never reaches the end of his inbox. There's always more messages, more people um, who want to hear from him. There's ever more complex, difficult problems to have to address. He admits that he's trying to save the world, but that he's at risk of burning himself out. And Joe Bix is just one of many of a generation of activists who care about helping people, about trying to make this world a better place. And yet at the very same time as people talk more and more about activism, we hear ever more this phrase being used, um, if I can get my screen to work, activism burnout. You see, it seems that whenever we try to solve other people's problems and the world's problems, it's not very long before we begin to struggle. Um, it becomes all too much, all too quickly for us. In fact, some of us here this evening on the screen, we don't have time to worry about the problems of the world because we're too consumed facing burnout for the problems in our own personal lives. Perhaps it is that you're just stressed with the thoughts of how you're going to heat your home this winter how you're going to put food on the table, how even you're going to just afford to put fuel in your car over the coming weeks with gas prices on the up. Maybe you're concerned about a son or a daughter whose heart is wandering from far from the Lord. Maybe you're trying to care for and support a loved one who's facing terminal illness. Maybe you're caring for someone or you love someone and they're struggling with their mental health. The list of possible struggles and strains goes on and on and on. But the good news at the heart of Christianity this evening for us is that we don't have to save ourselves and we don't have to be saviors of the world because the world already has a savior. And that's why I've entitled this message this evening, We Have a Champion. We're gonna be looking at the story of David and Goliath in 1 Samuel chapter 17, which is all about the fact that we have a champion. Now in context, 1 Samuel chapter 17 tells the continuing story of David's journey to be recognized as the new king of Israel. And the key to unlock this story is to notice the motif, it's repeated all the way throughout, of in-between people and things. Take, for example, the setting of the story. The, 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 the army of the Philistines are on one hill, the Israelites are on another hill, and in between there is the Valley of Elah. That's where the battle's going to be, in-between place. Then think about the characters. Goliath steps forward from the Philistine camp. He is described as the champion. The Hebrew word is actually the phrase, the man of the in-between. He challenges Israel to armed combat. Then David's introduced. David is the go-between between between his dad and his brothers in the front line. And then David's the one who volunteers to become Israel's champion, to become Israel's man of the in-between, to go out and face the giant. And so you see, this is a story which is all about champions. And particularly, it's about a champion who will represent God's people and take on their enemies. And what I want to share with you this evening is that we have a champion. We have a greater David. We have David's greater son, the Lord Jesus. He's our champion. Let me read for you the first 11 verses of 
1 Samuel chapter 17. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered at Sukkot, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Sukkot and Azekah. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah, and drew up in line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, with a valley between them. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs, and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear, his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and his shield bearer went before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we might fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard the words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Let's pause our reading of God's word there. Just as David, by the end of this story, is going to pick up five smooth stones from the brook, I've got five points for you this evening to help us reflect on the fact that we have a champion in the Lord Jesus. First point is going to help us look at those verses we just read in verses one through ten. And this is we're going to think about our champion's opponent. Many of our favorite fictional stories involve some sort of quest against a monster, whether it's for the little ones, the Gruffalo or Smug the dragon from The Hobbit, Darth Vader from Star Wars, the list goes on and on and on. But in this true story, the monster is Goliath. A great deal of time is spent in the first 10 verses describing Goliath to us. In particular, we're told that he measures six cubits in a span. That's around about three meters in height. If you translate the biblical units to our units, that would make him marginally taller than Robert um, Wadlow, who was the tallest man recorded in the, the Guinness Book of World Records. And although we would often focus on the monstrous size and height of Goliath, it seems to me the biblical author points out another monstrous feature of this man. We read in verse five that he was armed with a coat of mail and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. Here we're told that this giant is dressed head to toe in impenetrable armor. armor. And the Hebrew phrase is really interesting. It, it literally says that he was dressed in a coat of scales. Scales like snake skin. I think that's deliberate. I think that we're meant to associate in our minds this Philistine giant with another of God's enemies, God's ancient enemy, the fallen rebel angel, the devil himself. You recall that back in Genesis chapter three, the devil crept into the Garden of Eden. He tempted our first parents to rebel against God, to hijack God's plans for this world. He came disguised as a snake covered in scales. Also, if you know your Bibles, you know at the end of the Bible story in Revelation chapter 12, that same serpent reappears, this time as a fully grown dragon covered again in scales, waging war against God's people. I think that's who we're meant to think of here, that there is, there is a power behind Goliath. It's satanic in origin. And each day, this giant Goliath, he challenges Israel to single combat. The stakes are high. It's winner takes all. If Israel win, then the Philistines will be their slaves. But if Goliath wins, if he beats Israel's champion, then Israel will be his slaves. I think there's echoes there of, of the stakes that were set by the devil back in the garden. That whenever he tempted and triumphed over our first father, Adam, he caused all of Adam's sons and daughters, all of us, the entire human race, to become slaves and captives of sin and death and hell. Now, I think that what we can take from all of this is that Goliath is just one of the many agents of the kingdom of darkness in this world. There are many who oppose God and who oppress God's people. When you go back through history, you'll see there have been many Goliaths. There was Pharaoh of Egypt who sought to destroy the people of Israel. There was Nebuchadnezzar who destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. There was Herod who murdered the, the, the infants of Bethlehem to destroy the newborn Messiah. There were the many Caesars in the first three, 400 years of the church who sought to strangle the church in its crib. In the last century, there were the 
the Hitlers, the Stalins, the Maos, the Pol Pots, the dictators who sought to eliminate Christianity within the borders of their lands. And that's to say nothing of the end time Antichrist who's yet to come. Now, what are we to make of this? What are we to take away from this? Well, I think that it is that in this dark world, which is under the dominion of Satan, which is policed by his henchmen, we need to know that we have a champion in the Lord Jesus who is more than able to take him on and defeat him. As sometimes we sing the words of the old hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. We celebrate the fact that and though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear for God hath willed his truth to triumph for us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure. For lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. We need to know that although our opponent is very real, that our champion is also very real, Lord Jesus. And so that's the first thing, our champion's opponent. Let's move on to the next section of the text, which is our champion's team, verse 11 down to verse 23. After hearing the description of Goliath, it's no wonder that we read in verse 11, Israel's reaction. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. And their, their terror only ratchets up. This doesn't just happen on one day. This happens twice a day, every day, for 40 days. We read verse 16. For 40 days, the Philistine came forward, took his stand morning and evening, issuing his challenge. I think that just that little reference to 40 days is meant to make us remember the 40 years that Israel in the past had spent wandering in the wilderness, waiting because they were too afraid to go into the land of Canaan and take on the giants there. Again, Israel is waiting for 40 days, waiting for a champion to come forward and fight for them, defeat the giant. But the interesting thing is that the person whose job description actually involves fighting the people's battles, he's also paralyzed by fear. I'm talking about their king, King Saul. Now, when Saul was first introduced in 1 Samuel chapter 9 and chapter 10, we're told that he looked the part of a great king, a great warrior. He was head and shoulders taller than everybody else in the land. But here Saul, whenever he's faced with a, a giant who's head and shoulders and beyond taller than him, he, wa he wilts in Goliath's shadow. Nevertheless, God loves his people and he will not leave them helpless and hopeless and defenseless. And so immediately on the back of reading about Saul's fear and paralysis, along comes a little man called David. In stark contrast to Goliath's great size, we're told that David was the youngest. He's the smallest one in his family. He's too young to be conscripted into the army. He's not only short in years, he's short in stature. And yet David is God's chosen one, the man of the hour. And not only in this passage is David contrasted with Goliath, he's also contrasted with Saul. When Saul was first called to lead Israel to go out and fight their battles, Saul was afraid again. He ran off and he hid among the baggage. But it's interesting that when David arrives in the scene here, in verse 22, we read that David leaves his things in charge of the keeper of the baggage and runs to the front lines. He's a very, very different character to Saul. David may be young, he may be small, but he has a big heart. He sees the people of Israel afraid, paralyzed, cowering, and he decides that something has to be done for their sake. Someone has to do something. And if no one else will do it, then David volunteers to do it. I think in many ways, David resembles the heart of the Lord Jesus, our champion. We read in the Gospels that when Jesus sees the crowds, he had compassion on them. When he sees all their troubles, all their problems, all their fears, all their worries, all their insecurities, he has compassion on them. He sees that they were helpless and harassed like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus sees the needs of his people and he responds to them. He does something about them. He acts on their behalf. The good news for us is if you are a Christian this evening, if you're on Jesus's team through faith in him, then it's okay for you to admit that there are times in your life when you are afraid. It's okay for you to admit there are times when you are weak. It's okay for you to admit there are times that you don't know what to do and you just need his help. It's okay to admit those things because he's your champion. You're on his team and he is ready and willing to rise to help you and to fight for you and to defend you. So we thought, first of all, this evening about our champion's opponent, our champion's team. As we all now to think about our champion's motivation in verses 24 to 30. 
an interesting, a useful tool to have up your sleeve is to know that whenever a character first speaks in the Bible, it's almost always significant what they say. And in this section, we find David speaking for the very first time in all of Scripture. Verse 26, David says, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Now, if you've been paying attention, if you know this story well, you'll recognize that this is the very first time that anyone has mentioned God in this chapter. David's the first one to bring God into the picture. David alone sees that it is God's glory and honor which is at stake in this standoff. It's not just that Goliath is bringing disgrace on Israel, showing them up to be a bunch of cowards, but it's also that Goliath is making out that Israel's God is impotent and powerless and helpless. And David wishes to remove that reproach, to make God famous, rightly famous and glorious in the eyes of the watching world. This really isn't the story about David versus Goliath. This is really the story about God versus Goliath. The thing is that not everyone trusts David's motivations are good. Now, I wonder, do any of you have older siblings? Do you have an older brother or, or, or older sisters? I don't. I'm the oldest by eight years in my family. And, uh, well, some of you who have older siblings know what it's like to have them. And I fit the bill. I've not always been the kindest, nicest, most understanding big brother, I'm sad to confess to you. Well, David knows what it's like to be a younger brother. He knows what it's like to have an older brother. Eliab is his name. Eliab's a lot like Goliath. Eliab is the tallest in his family. We're told that back in chapter 16. And like Goliath, Eliab looks down on David. Eliab accuses David of, verse 28, of having evil in his heart. He suspects David of the basis motives of coming. He thinks that David has come to watch the battle. A bit like the ancient equivalent of going to the cinema to get your popcorn and watch Top Gun 2 at the moment. Hearing this accusation, David just sighs in exasperation. Verse 29, what have I done now? Familiar family story. Not Obviously not the first time that these brothers have clashed, knocked heads together. Nevertheless, I think that there's a hint here that Eliab sees something in his younger brother that David doesn't see about himself. It might be that David has some mixed motives here. But it's not all for the glory of God. Actually, look back at verse 26 and notice what's in the first sentence. In the second sentence, he talks about God. What, look at what he says in the first sentence. What shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine? What will I get is David's first question. What's in this for me if I go and do this thing? Interestingly, many, many years later, 2 Samuel chapter 11, David is at the height of his power. He is king. He has established his kingdom. He has won many battles. And he is lounging around his luxurious palace, enjoying the gettings of being king. And on that occasion, he wanted more. And he took another man's wife and abused her and killed that man and took, took her to be his wife. Then afterwards, he has to pray, create in me a clean heart, O God. Eliab accuses David of having evil in his heart and it seems that there is something there. There is a subtle spirit of self-serving, self-seeking entitlement in David, which clouds his otherwise good and godly motivations. Now, all of this is just a reminder to us that David is not the ultimate hero of this story. He's merely the forerunner of our champion, the Lord Jesus. Jesus, who always worked from the purest of motives, whose heart was solely aimed at vindicating the honor and glory of God in this world. Jesus did not come to be served, to see what he could get, but rather he came to serve and to save us, giving everything he had for us. With Jesus, we never have to wonder cynically, what's he trying to get out of me? What's in this for him? How is he trying to exploit me or take advantage of me? No, no, you never have to do that. Instead, you can trust Jesus, your champion, wholeheartedly and his motivations. That's the third thing. So we on to the fourth thing. This is the penultimate thing this evening. Verses 31 to verse 40, we find out about our champion's qualifications. The word quickly gets back to Saul that there is someone at long last who's willing to go out and face the giant. And Saul, I think at this point, is just sort of wiping the sweat off his brow. He's relieved. Thank goodness, because this means he's off the hook. 
but he decides to do his due diligence and find out who is this person who wants to go and face the giant. After all, the fate of the whole nation rests on that guy's shoulders. He wants to make sure that it's the right one. Sadly, it seems that Saul isn't very impressed with David. We read in verse 33, Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth. And he has been a man of war from his youth. In essence, Saul is saying, Goliath has been training for this battle since before you were born, David. You don't stand a chance. He'll make mincemeat out of you. But David doesn't give up at the first hurdle of having a difficult, hostile job interview. Instead, in verse 34, he lays out his experience, his qualifications. Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear, and if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. Verse 37, the Lord who delivered me from the paws of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Now, please don't misunderstand what David is saying here. He's not saying, I've got this. Don't worry, Saul. I've got this. David's saying, God's got this. God's got me. He's expressing his confidence in God. It's been tried and tested in his experience in the past. Just as God has used David to deliver his flocks from predators, David believes that God can deliver him and his people from this predator on this day. You see, David knows who his God is. He knows that his God is the God who slew the giants of Canaan in past days and can slay this giant on this day. David's key qualification is that he trusts God. That's all he needs. In the end, Saul says, verse 37, go, the Lord be with you, but this is one of those occasions where Saul says one thing and then immediately does something opposite. Immediately after that, we read in verse 38 that Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. Again, that's literally a coat of scales. Bronze helmet, bronze armor, scales. This is, this is the same word language used to describe Goliath's armor. Saul is like Goliath in so many ways. Israel wanted a king like the nations and Saul is a king like the nations. Saul is a proud, insecure, self-confident man whose heart is far from God. He says, the Lord be with you, David, but he doesn't act that way himself. David, however, refuses to be a king like that. David takes off Saul's armor. He says, I have not tested it. David instead wants to stick with his tried and tested experience in the Lord as God. Rather than going out armed as a warrior, he decides to go out dressed like a shepherd. And so we read verse 40. He took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand and he approached the Philistine. Just as a aside, uh, some of you have been to the Holy Land. Some of you may want to go to the Holy Land one day. You can go on tours to the Valley of Ella and you'll see lots of little stones and little pebbles there. But let me um, save you some money and some, some trouble. Don't think that you should go and pick up some stones and think maybe this is the stone that David used to slay the giant. Because actually what happens is that every month the, the, the authorities bring, those ma bring massive um, dumper trucks filled with stones and dump them into the Valley of Ella for all the tourists to make some money. So don't fall for the scam. But anyway, David does get five smooth stones from the brook. He goes to face the giant, not as a warrior, but as a shepherd. And the good news is that our champion is like a good shepherd like David, not a godless king like Saul. Jesus never wavered in his trust of God as father. Even when he was in the most desperate and dark of times, when he's in the agonies of Gethsemane, knowing what it will cost him to save the world, what awaits him on the cross the next day. Pouring out his heart before his father, he never stops trusting, believing that God knows what he's doing, knows what's best, trusting his father's will. It's Jesus' perfect faith and obedience that qualify him to be our savior. And his perfect faith, his perfect obedience counteracts our doubts and our disobedience. So we've thought about our champion's opponent, our champion's team, our champion's motivations, our champion's qualifications. But now you've got to the bit that we've all been waiting for, the actual battle, 
And this is the final part of the message this evening about our champion's success. So David walks alone into the Valley of Elah to face the giant all alone. Everyone on the Israelite side is waiting in tense excitement to see what happens next. Meanwhile, on the opposite side, the Philistines are already breaking out the celebrations. They're rubbing their hands with glee. They're laughing. They're mocking. They think, who is this wee boy coming out to face our giant arm for war? Well, who is this guy? We've already won. But then David speaks up and gives this rousing speech. Verse 45. You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand. Verse 47, the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hand. This is one of those moments that we should be getting up out of our chairs and cheering and shouting and dancing for joy. This is fighting talk. And so after 47 verses, finally, we have arrived at the battle. But it's almost then blink and you miss it because it's over in three or four verses. You know what happens? David goes forward. He puts one of his stones in his sling, swings it round and round and round, lets it go. It hits Goliath in the head. Goliath falls backwards. And then David gets his sword, uh, takes, uh, takes Goliath's sword and chops off his head. That little detail I notice is not included in most children's Bibles, but there you go. That's what's really there. That's what really happened. And then we read verse 51. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and Judah rose with a shout and pursued the Philistines. And so David, the champion, all alone, he wins the victory. And all of Israel, the army, celebrate and join in and share his victory. Just as Goliath has been described through this chapter like a snake covered in scales, it's fitting that he should die from a head wound, reminding us of the first gospel promise back in Genesis 3.15 that one day God would send a saviour who would crush the head of the serpent. Reminds us that David's just a preview of the champion who's to come. But the lesson of this story in 1 Samuel 17 isn't about the triumph of underdogs. It's not about slaying the giants in our lives with our five stones of prayer, Bible study, and whatever other three you want to make up to, to get to your quota of five stones. Instead, what this story is all about is David's God. And the good news for us this evening is that David's God is our God and that we have a greater David in the Lord Jesus, our champion. We're not David in this story. We're the Israelites on the hill behind David. We're cowering in fear and weakness. We are trapped in our sin. We are doomed to die. But the good news is that we have a champion, one who is willing to go alone into the valley of the shadow of death and take on the monster on our behalf. On the cross, Jesus has been our champion, our man of the in-between, the one who has stood between our sin and God's judgment against sin. And there in his death, he's conquered our greatest enemy, sin, death, and hell. He's risen from the grave. Today, he's ascended in heaven as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And we as people on the earth, we who have joined his team through faith, we share in his victory today and forever. The theme song of the Christian life is not, we are the champions, look at us, look how brilliant we are. Instead, our anthem is, we have a champion. Look at what he has done. The story finishes here with David taking Goliath's armor and putting it in his tent so that every morning when he opens his eyes, every night when he goes to bed and says his prayers, he has a testimony, a memorial, a reminder of God's faithfulness to him and delivering him from the giant. I think that's what we need to have in our lives, that we would have daily a, a memorial, a time, something that would cause us to remember all that God has done for us in the gospel. As Jerry Bridges puts it so well, we need to preach the gospel to ourselves daily because every day we forget the gospel. We forget the victory, which is ours in Christ. So there you go. There's the story of David and Goliath and these five things about how Jesus is our champion. Well, we started off this evening with the story of Joe Wicks. Heard about his burning himself out trying to fight other people's battles, fix their problems. The thing is that we can't fight other people's battles for them. 
We can't take on their giants. We've got enough battles of our own to fight. We've got enough giants in our own lives to face. But the good news is that we never have to fight our battles alone. We never have to face our giants alone. Jesus went into the valley alone so that we would never have to go into the valley alone. Today, we have a champion, the Lord Jesus, who is for us, not against us, who is in us by his Holy Spirit, who is with us no matter what happens. We have a champion. And so this evening, let me ask you, what battles are you faced in your life? Why don't you ask the Lord to help you and to fight for you? Where do you need reinforcements? I've just got a visitor here in my study. Where, where, in your, where in your life do you need reinforcements in your battle? Where do you need resupplies in your battle? Why don't you ask the Lord Jesus to meet those needs that you have? Why don't we just pause and close our eyes for a minute or so and uh, reflect and pray and speak to the Lord Jesus in prayer and ask him to come and help us and be our champion. Well, thank you, Lord, that uh, we are not alone. You know so well the things that we face in this world. But we thank you that we are not alone. We thank you that the power that raised the Lord Jesus from the dead is uh, alive and at work in us. And so as we go forth into another week to face more battles, we pray that you would help us to make you famous, Lord Jesus. We pray you would help us to vindicate your honor and your glory to be bold and to be courageous, to stand for you and to speak for you and to live for you, to make a difference for you. I pray that you would help us as we face many challenges in our lives, in our families, in our circumstances. Help us, Lord, to look to you and to trust you and to lean on you. Thank you that you are our champion. Thank you that you, that you love us, that you're for us and not against us, and that through you we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Thank you for these wonderful truths. Uh, apply them to our hearts, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.